It's a great honor to be here today at the University of Moravia and to receive this wonderful award. I uh, deeply appreciate it. I deeply appreciate everybody coming out to hear me speak to them. Uh, I would like to thank the Dean, Vice Rector, the President of the Senate, and the Deputy Mayor all for their very kind words about me and for their welcoming words. I would like to thank Professor Farr and especially Professor Possibly, who is largely responsible for organizing my visit to Romania. This is the first time I have ever been in the country, and I hope it's not the last time. I'd like to come back again for sure. Again, thank you very much for the honorary doctorate. It means a great deal to me. The subject that I was asked to speak about today was the future of the world order. And that's a very big subject. So I thought that what I would talk about in particular is American foreign policy in the age of Trump. Because I think it's fair to say that the future of the world order depends in good part not completely, but in good part on American foreign policy. And American foreign policy these days depends greatly on what President Trump thinks, says, and does. And everywhere I go in the world, people always want to know, how do I think about President Trump? Because they're actually quite puzzled. Uh, so I thought what I would do today is I give you my views on American foreign policy these days under President Trump. And then I would be happy to take questions on that subject and almost any other subject that you want to talk about. I actually could give about five or six different talks today on subjects like the rise of China, the crisis over Ukraine, future NATO, international relations theory, and so forth and so on. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to restrict my talk to President Trump and American foreign policy. But again, I can answer questions on any subject that you want. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? What's Trump's foreign policy? Just a couple of general points. First of all, it's not easy to know, for sure. And I'm going to tell you how I think about it, but I'm not going to be able to give you a definitive answer as to where exactly American foreign policy under President Trump is going. And part of the reason is that it is quite early in his presidency. As you know, an American president is in office for four years. And President Trump took office in January 2017. So he's not even at the halfway point yet. And he may even be reelected. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you talk to people in the United States, both Democrats and Republicans, <clears throat> most people think there is a reasonable chance that he will get reelected and be president eight years. And if that were the case, it's really early in the game, so to speak. Final point that I would make, he is a radical individual in terms of his views on American foreign policy. And I will make that clear as we go along here. We have rarely seen anyone like President Trump in the United States. And I'm not talking about his behavior here. I'm talking about his views. He ran against the American foreign policy establishment. He defeated all of his Republican opponents in the primaries, and then he defeated Hillary Clinton. And he did that by expressing radical views on foreign policy. One can argue that his views were right or wrong. That's a different issue. 
but it's very important to understand, and I'll make this clear as we go along, that he ran against the establishment. There are three key actors in the story that you have to think about here. One is candidate Trump. What he said during the 2016 campaign and during the period before he became the president. Then you have to think about what President Trump has said and done since he entered the White House in January 2017. And I'll spend a lot of time here comparing candidate Trump with President Trump. And then the final actor in the story is the foreign policy establishment, which is sometimes known as the bloc. And again, as I emphasized to you before, President Trump and candidate Trump both have had an antagonistic view towards the bloc. <clears throat> These are my basic framing points. First, we want to talk about candidate Trump and the bloc. Then we want to talk about President Trump and the blog. Candidate Trump beat the blog. Whether President Trump can beat the blog, whether he can really implement a radical foreign policy remains to be seen. And for Romanians, you care greatly about the future of NATO. And we'll talk more about this. You know what President Trump's views are on NATO. He says it's obsolete. The blob completely disagrees. Who's going to win? That's the question. And NATO is just one among many issues. So what I want to do is talk about candidate Trump versus the blob, and then talk about President Trump's fight with the blob and who is likely to prevail or to win in the end. <clears throat> That's the basic outline of my talk, okay? The Bob's views on foreign policy. I'll lay that out. Then I'll lay out candidate Trump's views on foreign policy. Then President Trump's foreign policy so far. And then what lies ahead? Okay, let's talk about the key foreign policy issues. The first I want to talk about is the liberal international order. Then I'm going to talk about U.S. alliances in East Asia and Europe. And this is where NATO comes in. I'm going to talk about nuclear proliferation, <coughs> potential rivals of the United States, the greater Middle East, and climate change. Those are all the issues I want to talk about. And again, what I want to do here to start is I want to talk about candidate Trump versus the blog. Okay, this is the the liberal international <coughs> order, which we hear a lot about these days. During the Cold War, and then especially after the Cold War, when the Cold War ended, the United States the foreign policy establishment was deeply committed to creating a liberal international order. And that order involved three things effective international institutions like the EU, NATO, World Trade Organization, World Bank, so forth and so on, NAFTA, so forth and so on. Americans tend to love international institutions. Certainly the bloc loves international institutions. Furthermore, we were committed to an open international economy. Here the emphasis on free trade, the movement of capital across borders, and so forth and so on. And then finally, and very importantly, the United States is deeply committed, or has been deeply committed, to spreading democracy around the world. And by the way, if you look at American foreign policy in Eastern Europe, to include Romania, since the Cold War ended, you can see all three elements of the liberal international order at play. We expanded institutions like NATO and the EU eastward for the purposes of getting countries like Romania and Poland and Estonia and Latvia and so forth and so on into those institutions. We were interested in getting you hooked on capitalism 
integrating you into this open international order, removing tariffs, and then most importantly, from an American point of view, promoting democracy. You all know about the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. This was all designed to promote democracy. From an American point of view, it's enormously important that countries like Romania, Poland, Hungary, Ukraine, Georgia, all be democratic, they all be part of this open international economy, and furthermore, that uh, you join these institutions. That's the liberal international order. And the law has been deeply committed to the liberal international order. President Trump was opposed to all three elements of the order. Just think about that. With regard to democracy promotion, he said, I want to get out of the business of democracy promotion. This is not something we should be doing. And furthermore, when we tried to do it, we failed at every turn. Look at the greater Middle East. Look at the mess we made there. That's democracy promotion at work. Plus, as you all know, President Trump is very comfortable cozying up with dictators <coughs> and authoritarian leaders. He prefers Putin's and the Erdogan's of the world to liberal democratic leaders like Angela Merkel. So he ran against democracy promotion. He ran against the open international economy. He believes fervently that the United States is being badly hurt by the present international economy. And as you know, he likes tariffs. He likes playing hardball with countries all over the world on issues like trade. The foreign policy establishment thinks exactly the opposite. So there's a fundamental <laughs> disagreement between candidate Trump and now President Trump on that issue. And then we come to institutions. He does not like institutions. I don't think President Trump or candidate Trump has ever seen an institution that he likes. He said that NATO was obsolete. He loathes the EU. He loathes the World Trade Organization. He does not like the World Bank. He does not like the IMF. One of the first things that he did when he became president was he pulled out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We've done away with NAFTA. He does not like institutions. Very importantly, when you think about the liberal international order, which has been the heart and soul of American foreign policy, certainly since the Cold War ended, you see that candidate Trump ran against it. Then there are alliances. The US has basically two sets of alliances that really matter. One set is in East Asia. And this really matters these days because China is potential hegemon in Asia and therefore a serious threat to the United States. And then, of course, there are the alliances uh, here uh, as well as in the East. And here we're talking about NATO. Here we are. Uh, as I said before, he believes NATO is obsolete. Uh, he made it very clear during the campaign uh, that if he had his way, he'd pull the Americans out of Europe uh, and there would be no with regard to the bilateral alliances that we have in East Asia with Japan and South Korea, he has little use for those alliances. My intuition, my gut feeling, is that of all the alliances uh, that the United States has, the one he likes the least is the alliance with South Korea. Uh, he really is very unhappy with that uh, And our alliances, with other Asian countries like the Philippines and Australia and Singapore, those are much looser alliances. Uh, he nevertheless has not much use for them either. This is the subject of nuclear proliferation. During the campaign, with regard to Germany and especially Japan, even South Korea, he was 
not that bothered by the thought that if the United States abandoned South Korea and Japan, they might develop nuclear weapons. This is antithetical to the plot. The foreign policy establishment in the United States is deeply, profoundly committed to combating nuclear proliferation. So when President, excuse me, when candidate Trump indicated that it wouldn't be so bad if Japan or South Korea developed nuclear weapons, he was really at odds with the establishment. Iran and North Korea, I put one star there as opposed to the other, because Iran and North Korea is where he did not seem to be at odds in any meaningful way with the foreign policy establishment. And then finally, on the subject of proliferation more generally, candidate Trump didn't seem to have a lot of trouble with proliferation. It's not something that really bothered him, which again, in general, put him at odds with the establishment. Potential rivals, with regard to China, the establishment was interested in engaging with China. Candidate Trump made it clear he wanted to confront China. With regard to Russia, the foreign policy establishment wanted to confront Russia. It was very unhappy with the Russians. You all know how the foreign policy establishment in the United States reacted to the Ukraine crisis. The Russophobia in the United States was really quite powerful. President Trump, excuse me, candidate Trump had exactly the opposite view. He wanted to improve relations with the Russians. With regard to Iran and North Korea, there's no difference there. That's where the establishment, our policy establishment, and candidate Trump were basically on the same page. The greater Middle East, as I say, with regard to Iran, no real difference. With regard to Syria, huge difference. Candidate Trump wanted to get out of Syria. With regard to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, no real difference. With regard to Afghanistan, big difference. Candidate Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan. He said, Afghanistan's a lost cause. Let's get out. Didn't want to get involved in Syria, wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Israel is a complicated subject. Uh, at some points in the campaign, he all made, almost made it sound like he was going to get tough with Israel. Then he backed off. But he wasn't very clear on his views on Israel during the campaign. So I wouldn't say he was at odds in any meaningful way with the establishment on Israel. And then just on climate change, his general attitude toward climate change, uh, he doesn't have much use for the idea. Uh, he doesn't think this is candidate Trump. <coughs> And of course, it's true of President Trump as well. He doesn't think climate change is a big problem. And the Paris Climate Agreement of December 2015 was something that he had contempt for. And to get ahead of myself, one of the first things he did as president, as you know, was to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. If you look at these key foreign policy issues, just think about this. He ran against all three key elements of the liberal international order, he demonstrated significant contempt for our alliance partners both in Europe and in East Asia. And it's not that surprising with regard to Europe because there's no real threat in Europe like there was during the Cold War or during the 1930s or before World War I. But there is a real threat in East Asia from an American point of view, which is the rise of China. Nevertheless, he had little use for our allies in East Asia, and of course, little use for our allies here in Europe. Nuclear proliferation, he had radical views. With regard to potential rivals, and they were talking mainly about Russia and China, he had radical views. The greater Middle East, with regard to Afghanistan and Syria, radical views, and certainly radical views with regard to climate change. So you see that candidate Trump, candidate Trump <clears throat> was running against the foreign policy establishment on almost every important dimension of US foreign policy. Really quite remarkable. And he won. Just think that. He ran in the Republican primaries and defeated every Republican. He swept the table. 
And then he ran against Hillary Clinton. And to my utter amazement, and to the utter amazement of many Americans, he won. Now, he didn't win simply because of foreign policy. But foreign policy did not hurt him. Now, it's President Trump versus the bar. Now he's in office. Let me just say something. You understand that when Barack Obama ran for president, he ran against the ball. He did not run on a radical, as radical a platform as candidate Trump. But candidate Obama called for a much more modest foreign policy. Candidate Obama said that what the United States should do is engage in nation building at home. Candidate Obama and candidate Trump understand that the American people, the American public, is not interested in running all around the world fighting all these wars. <coughs> you all understand that the United States has fought seven wars since the Cold War ended. Seven wars. We have been at war for two out of every three years since the Cold War ended. The United States of America is a highly militarized state. Very important to understand that. And the American public does not have much interest in continuing those policies. And that's, again, why candidate <coughs> Obama and candidate Trump were elected, despite the fact they were against American foreign policy as it existed in 2008, and in 2016. However, once candidate Obama became President Obama, and President Obama went up against the blob, the blob beat him at every turn. And he admitted that shortly before he left office. Very important to understand that. He gave a very important interview. This is President Obama with Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic Monthly magazine shortly before he left office. And he admitted in that interview that the blob had defeated him. And he had been forced, he, President Obama, had been forced to play by what he called, play according to what he called the Washington Playbook. So the question we were asking ourselves now is whether or not the same thing will happen. It's a question that's on the table. Can President Trump beat the law, beat the foreign policy establishment, and actually implement that radical foreign policy, which he enunciated, which he elaborated on during the campaign? There are three possible outcomes. One is the law wins. Two is Trump wins his radical views become policy. And three, it's a draw. Trump wins some and the blob wins. Okay, the blob wins. If you believe the blob will win, it's largely an argument about structure over agency. This is a familiar debate to many of you. Structure basically says that any president of the United States is in an iron cage. His arms are tied, and there are real limits to what he can do. Right? That's, the structure is just so powerful. And of course, there's a domestic structure and an international structure. The other way of thinking about this is the agency. And when you say agency wins, that means Trump wins. And that means President Trump has a lot of maneuver room. And he can beat the block. Structure will not constrain him. But let's just talk for the moment about the argument that the blob wins. Focus on domestic structure. First point is the blob is a formidable fighting force. The foreign policy establishment has deep roots, huge numbers of people in it, and they beat back Obama. And if they beat back Obama, 
maybe they can beat back Trump. Second point that you want to remember, and this is very important, is that there are not many people in the foreign policy world who share President Trump's views. That means he doesn't have many people that he can choose as advisors who can work with him to help beat the ball. It's really President Trump against the ball. This is what happened to Obama. You all understand that President Obama became famous on foreign policy issues because he opposed the Iraq war. But when President Obama, when President Obama had to populate his administration with advisors, when President Obama had to find a Secretary of State, a National Security Advisor, a Secretary of Defense, he could not find a single person who would oppose the Iraq war. So he surrounded himself with people from the foreign policy establishment. And it's not surprising that President Obama lost the law. So this is an argument that if you look at President Trump, he's surrounded by people like General Mattis in the Pentagon and a lot of other people like Rex Tillerson and General McMaster who were all part of the foreign policy establishment. Now he fired them, he didn't fire Mattis yet, but he fired the other two. And he's looking for people who are more simpatico with his views. But you just want to understand there are not a lot of those people out there. Third point is we have checks and balances in the United States. President Trump has to get the permission of Congress to do a number of things. And Congress is filled with people who represent the foreign policy establishment. So he gets checked there. And then finally, you have the deep state. And there's no question the deep state has been at war with President Trump. You see this on a daily basis. The deep state, here we're talking about the Central Intelligence Agency, the Pentagon, these are all people who are deeply committed to, their, to traditional foreign policy establishment. And they're at war with Trump. So Trump faces a lot of obstacles on the domestic front. Then there's the international structure argument. Let's just talk about East Asia for a second. The fact is, with the rise of China, the United States needs the Japanese. The United States needs the South Koreans. These are going to be our allies if we have any hope of containing Chinese expansion in East Asia. So the idea that Trump can just treat the South Koreans and the Japanese and the Filipinos and the Australians and the Vietnamese and the Singaporeans and so forth and so on like they don't matter is not going to wash because the United States needs allies to contain China. So that's an argument that says the international structure, in addition to the domestic structure, puts President Trump in an iron cage and forces him to basically continue the policies that his predecessors had pursued. This is the argument that President Trump went. And has three major components to it. The first is that the international structure is changing in ways that play to Trump's advantage. And this is the rise of China. The rise of China is going to have a huge effect on American foreign policy over time. We can talk more about this later. It's going to have a huge effect on the future of NATO, uh, future of US, European relations. The United States is beginning to focus laser-like on East Asia in ways that it never has in the past. The United States is a country in the past that focused mainly on Europe. Europe was the most important area of the world in the United States outside of the Western Hemisphere. That's changing. Europe is no longer that important to the United States. East Asia is of enormous importance. It's because there's a lot of wealth out there, but number two, and most importantly, there's this country called China that is a rising behemoth. And the United States always puts its gun sights on rising behemoths. Whether it's the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, or Imperial Germany. We concentrate mostly on behemoths. 
potential hedge funds. And the potential hedge fund in the system we're going to be caring about, we care about now and we care about more and more, is in the state. So the world is beginning, you know, the glacis plates are beginning to move. And that's going to give President Trump a lot of freedom of maneuver. Second point, as I said to you before, he was elected on the platform that he was going to change American foreign policy. It's not like the American people are opposed to what he's doing. I believe if President Trump were to begin to reduce American troops in Europe and begin to talk about pulling out of NATO, there would not be a lot of resistance from the American public. There would be huge resistance from the law. No question about that. But in terms of public opinion, the American people are much more interested in spending money at home than abroad, number one. And number two, they're not interested in fighting any more wars. And as I said to you, the United States is addicted to war. And then finally, I, I believe that President Trump is an exceptional individual. He's an exceptional leader in ways that we have never seen before in the United States. Uh, his ability to challenge the conventional wisdom, to change, challenge conventional policies, and, and do it in ways that you would think would get him into serious trouble, but do not. It's really quite remarkable. If President Trump were to disappear tomorrow, it's hard to imagine anyone who could replace him who would be as effective anywhere near as effective at challenging foreign policy establishment the same. I don't say this as a supporter of President Trump. I just am making the simple point that he is sui generis. We have never seen anything like him, and he is not to be underestimated. And he is determined to radically change American foreign policy. Now, I'm not saying that he will succeed. I tried to make the case a moment ago that the Bois will defeat him. But he's not President Obama. President Obama was no match for the Bois. President Trump is a match for the Bois. He is sui generis. And you don't want to underestimate that. And when you marry that fact with the fact that the structure of the system is changing with the rise of China, you don't want to underestimate what he might. What's happened so far? I think the law has largely prevailed. I think that the Trump, Trump has won some victories, but I think the law has largely prevailed. You certainly see this with regard to NATO. There's no evidence that NATO is going away. Despite all of President Trump's rhetoric about NATO, despite the fact that President Trump comes to Europe drives Europeans crazy with his rhetoric, NATO remains intact. And one could argue NATO has actually gotten stronger, certainly in Eastern Europe, since the Ukraine crisis. Talk about the evidence more generally. Afghanistan, we're still there. We're still there 17 years later. And basically what President Obama is doing, excuse me, what President Trump is doing, is what President Obama did in Afghanistan, kicking the can down the road. He doesn't want to get out, even though he said he was going to get out during the campaign. He doesn't want to get out because he doesn't want to be blamed for losing Afghanistan. So we're still there. We're even more involved in Syria, unfortunately, from my perspective. We're more involved in Syria than we were before he went to the White House. With regard to Israel and the Palestinians, you know, he hasn't changed very much at all. He did move the embassy foolishly from Tel Aviv, the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But the United States is still as committed to Israel as ever. Uh, with regard to Russia and China, the blob has beat him on Russia. The Russians, I was in Russia before the election. And the Russians did not think Trump was going to win. But they really hoped that Trump would win because they thought that 
Trump we improve relations with Russia? Well, Trump won, and relations with Russia have gotten worse. I think the Russians had to do it all over again. They'd rather have Hillary Clinton in the White House. I could explain why that's the case. But the problem is beat Trump back on Russia. And with regards to China, uh, I think that uh, you know the blob and Trump are basically in sync today with regard to how we should deal with China. There are no real big differences there. But with regard to climate change, Trump won on climate change. Right? I think the establishment correctly believes that we should be involved in trying to deal with climate change and that Trump's policies are foolish. But Trump won then. NATO and East Asian alliances. President Trump has made a lot of noise, as I said before. He's scared a lot of Europeans, especially in Eastern Europe. But again, NATO remains intact. Our alliance with Japan remains intact. Our alliance with South Korea remains intact. One could argue those alliances have been somewhat frayed, but as best I can tell, not much has really changed on the ground. With regard to nuclear proliferation, I think the blob has won there. Uh, one could argue that where the blob has lost is actually on Iran, because President Trump pulled out of the nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, and the blob was committed to the JCPOA. But uh, that would be the only issue uh, on which the proliferation realm, uh, on where uh, where Trump is going to block. Liberal international order. Uh, with regard to international institutions, we replaced NAFTA with a new version of NAFTA. Uh, NATO and the EU are still intact. The WTO is probably going to change its ways uh, because of pressure from Trump, but the WTO is not going away. The IMF is not going away. The World Bank. I think the blob is one on institutions. On democracy promotion, I think Trump is basically one. Not much question. We're out of business in democracy promotion, certainly at the end of the rifle barrel. Uh, we'll do some of it, but, but not much. And with regard to the open international economy, I think Trump has won some significant victories there. I think the United States is becoming, generally speaking, more protection. So I think it's on the liberal international order, it's democracy promotion and the open international economy where Trump has won. But on most other issues, most other issues, except for maybe climate change, the blob has managed to, to keep Trump in bed. Where are we headed? Uh, I think, you know, the world is changing independent of Trump. One of the questions you have to ask yourself is whether or not you think Trump is the cause of all the changes that's taking place in the world, or whether or, not, whether or not you think Trump is a manifestation or a consequence of that change. And I think Trump is, by and large, a consequence. And I would say that there are two things that are happening in the world uh, that foretell change. One is the rise of China and the return of great power politics. Um, as you know, during the, cold, during, the, during the Cold War, the world was bipolar. There were two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And those two great powers dominated large portions of the globe. You <coughs> Romanians fully understand that, having been in the Soviet's orbit. Right? So there's the Soviet Union and its allies, the United States and its allies. Then the Soviet Union went away, and we went from a bipolar world to a unipolar world. And in a unipolar world, there's by definition only one great power. And that one great power was the United States of America. Uh, and in that unipolar world, the United States went to great lengths to create a liberal international order. The United States, in that unipolar world, had great power went to great lengths to expand NATO, to expand the EU eastward, to promote democracy, 
not only in places like Eastern Europe, but also in places like China and East Asia more generally. Right? And we can do that because we live in a unipolar world. Well, now we're going to a multipolar world with the rise of China and the resurrection of Russian power. We now have three great powers in the system, the United States, United States, China, and Russia. So we went during the Cold War from bipolarity <coughs> to unipolarity in the post-Cold War world. And now we're moving into a multipolar world. East Europeans worry more about the Russians today than they did in the past. Why? Because of the resurrection of Russian power. The United States worries more about China today than it did in the 1990s. Why? Because of the continuing rise of China. So President Trump, it's very important to understand this, enters office at a time when unipolarity is ending. And multipolarity is emerging. And that leads to my second point, that the liberal international order is beginning to collapse, in large part because we're moving from unipolarity to multipolarity. And all of this is to say that the world is changing independent of Trump. So here's the $64,000 question, as we used to say when I was a young boy. We probably would now call it the $64 million question. But when I was young, $64,000 was a lot of money. Is President Trump, the American leader, best suited to deal with the world ahead? And I think the answer is regrettably no. Thank you. with our dear students, uh, Alexandra and uh, Anna Maria. And uh, we are here in order to, to pay a special tribute to Professor John uh, Mearsheimer, uh, who uh, was here at uh, our University of Oradea on the invitation of the International Relations and European Studies Department, uh, because he was awarded with the title of Dr. Honoris Causa. We are here with our dear students in order to uh, discuss about uh, Mr. Mirsheimer's presence. In Oradea, I would like to know uh, our students' opinion and uh, what uh, did the presence of such an honorable personality represented for them. So, girls, what do you know? Have you heard about Mr. Mirsheimer before? Yeah, um, we already had an idea about who Mr. Mersheimer was because his books are mandatory for our classes and uh, uh, also he has lots of interesting titles to read such as uh, Why Leaders Lie and uh, I, when we heard that he's coming it was such a great honor and a pleasure for us to be here and uh, hear his uh, Lectio Magistralis. Okay, so what do you think about Alexio uh, Magistralis? What was the title? Uh, were you able to find out new information? Yes, of course. So the title of uh, Alexio Magistralis was American Foreign Policy in the Age of Trump. Uh, he came up with uh, new ideas, with new concepts, and I think, and I am really uh, straightful to the idea that uh, he said that everything that is going global is um, leading by USA. I think that we can agree with his statement. And first of all, uh, he expected and he explained us regarding the blob. What the blob is, is the American foreign, foreign policy establishment. It's like an um, organization against the presidency of Trump. It's not necessarily an organization. It's practically the entire institution exactly. together with the staff. Uh, rooted deep ideological roots even from the Cold War, so practically the entire American foreign policy establishment and related various aspects and various issues with the current president, with Donald Trump. Uh, uh, there are uh, a few. 
Uh, Anna Maria, for example, uh, if you remember, what did Mr. Mischheimer uh, tell us about the problem of climate change? And for example, how the blob see the problem of climate change and the Paris Climate Accords? And what is the perception of Donald Trump according to that? Uh, according to that, well, Donald Trump is uh, really centered in uh, increasing the um, America's uh, money uh, in order to budget. develop the industry to create new workplaces. Yeah, for yeah, the people. and uh, he said he said that uh, he's going to resign for from that uh, tree to withdraw from. It. And uh, uh, we can see. Uh, that uh, decision of Trump as logical because he's really centered to save America, if we can say it. So, uh, with his withdrawal from uh, Paris Climate Agreement, uh, uh, Trump has defeated the blob uh, and he was one step ahead of them. And uh, that's why I think that uh, it was a smart move in order to increase the economics of uh, economy of America. So this is actually the America uh, first uh, policy. Okay, so Mr. Mischheimer, during his presentation, answered to a lot of questions coming from the audience. And one person from the audience asked him about how, what is his perception, uh, how will the future uh, world order look like? So what do you think about your response? He made a very funny response, putting America first, so definitely in the future the rules of the game will be dictated by the USA as being yes. the biggest superpower, political, economic and military superpower, followed by China. So China is coming really close. And after it, on the third place, you put Russia. And to the astonishment of many of us uh, in, the, in the room, uh, while the Lectio Magistralis, he told that to the European continent and to the European Union, he does not forecast any kind of a future. Exactly. And this big balance of power. Uh, yes, as uh, you said, he thought that everything that is going global is about the Trump presidency and about the USA presidency and the laws. Um, I think I agree with him. And um, as uh, we already know, the biggest power is the leader in everything. And as far as he's, the USA is getting around China, Russia, and so on. Um, we, the small countries, we have nothing to do, and we will just say yes or no, and we just be there for them. And uh, we cannot come with a bigger power than they ha already have. Okay, so this is how the future world order would look like, uh, according to Mr. Mischheimer. Yeah. What do you think? What did his presence represent to Oradea, to Romania, and to the Oradean acad academic community? Uh, well, it was a great honor to have him uh, here, because uh, it it proves that Oradea uh, is a, a big uh, center, uh, research center of uh, regarding the international relationships and uh, it, it's amazing that we managed to do that and to have Mr. Mearsheimer here. It, it was astonished. his presence was astonishing. Okay, so what does his presence represent to you personally? Uh, first of all, as far as we know, Oradea is one of the greatest cities of Romania and uh, from uh, the university point of view or from the academic point of view, I think that it's a very good benefit for us, for the student and for the rector as well, to have uh, John Mersheimer here with us. And um, we came up with uh, a very good and uh, very high opportunity for coming him, uh, for uh, calling him to come here. And uh, we, I think that we are one of the best in this kind of conference from the whole Romania and we are the only university that uh, could call him and could invite him to be here in presence in Oradea, in the University of Oradea. Okay, and uh, I would like also for us, it, as you said, girls, it's a huge honor and a pleasure to welcome such a great personality from the field of international relations and uh, political science. And he also was very pleased 
to be to be here and he said that he will definitely come back yeah. to Romania and to Radia and we welcome him. We are looking forward. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.